This is Tuesday, November 30th. There are 231 days until San Diego Comic Con 2022. Welcome to SD Concast, the official podcast of the San Diego Comic Con unofficial blog. V A N U A P W E Go. Oh my God, I love Live Journal and my Live Journal loves me. Good evening, everybody. I am your host, James Riley, and joining me on the podcast, as always, Carrie Dixon. Hey, guys. Thank you so much for joining us. And our special roundtable panelists tonight. All of them went to Comic-Con Special Edition. First up, we have Andy Wagner. Hey, how's everybody doing? And from outside Comic-Con, Kim Twombly. Hello. And Parks and Cons himself, half of it at least, Sean Marshall. Hello, everybody. All right. So this is the special edition, Comic-Con special edition wrap-up podcast. Uh, we're trying to work in special edition as many different places as we can. Uh, we'll take comments, questions during the show. You can tweet us at SD underscore comic underscore con. Uh, use the hashtag SD Concast. Uh, we can also uh, get your comments or questions in the YouTube live chat if you wish to comment there. Um, so as you can see, this is a larger group than usual. Uh, because we wanted to get a variety of perspectives on the con itself uh, to see what everyone's thoughts were, because we all had different things we were doing and different times we were there and all those kinds of different things that, you know, you can do at Comic-Con. Um, and Carrie is basically going to be our moderator for the evening. Uh, since she was not there, she will uh, direct us as you will, as if we were the panelists, and she's the moderator at a panel. So let's get started. Um, I guess it's up to you. I guess it's all you now, Carrie. It's all, it's all me. All right. So Comic-Con Special Edition was obviously over the weekend. What were your expectations and how do you feel that the convention lived up to that? And I would like to start with Kim. Oh, gosh. Okay. <laughs> First one. Uh, that's, a, it's, that's, a, that's a big question. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> it was a lot to process. It was so... Um, I, I loved it. I went into it um, not having much expectation because we had a freaking holiday to get through. So there was multiple things that needed to be juggled last week. And um, I had a, it, it, you know, it really, I guess, exceeded the expectations I had because I didn't, I didn't set them high. I knew it would be smaller so, since it didn't sell out. There was a lot of hints of things that were going to happen. Um, and it just was easy. And people were saying, oh, it's gonna be like WonderCon. Well, it isn't like WonderCon because it's at the San Diego Convention Center. So that was wonderful just to be there and have that experience, but on a much smaller scale and people were hearkening it to, you know, 20 years ago, 15 years ago. Um, so I had a great time. James, what about you? Now you only went for one day. Yeah, I was traveling for the holidays. So I was only able to go on Saturday. And uh, I think, just as with everyone else, um, I was not expecting much. I, I mean, the whole time we were talking about it, we were always expecting it to be at most WonderCon. And WonderCon is always an easier convention to go to. Uh, lines are shorter, crowds are less. It's still crowded uh, at a normal WonderCon. And there's, you know, there are lines, but I was expecting just at most that. And Honestly, there was pieces of that, but for the most part, it was, it was just so easy to attend. Uh, I mean, I don't know if I've gone to a big convention like that, that was that easy to attend. There was, there were crowds and there were lines, um, but nothing felt, uh, stressed about it. Um, it was a little weird. And I was, I was telling a few people this at the end of the night that I always felt like like from the moment I got there that I, I should be doing something else or I felt like there was more that I should be doing, but there was nothing else to do and there was not more to do. <laughs> it's just muscle memory for being yeah, at Comic-Con. Yeah, exactly. that's all it is. Felt like, you know, I, I have to do like one thing and hope I can get one thing done and feel stressed about getting that one thing done. And there was like, if I wanted to do something, I'd just go do it. Yeah. Andy, how was the convention for you? I definitely have to agree with James in that it was uh, about the size uh, that I expected. 
I didn't expect any Hollywood really. And to have those two offsites, one for La Brea and then one for Peacemaker, uh, those were welcome surprises, I thought. Uh, kind of just a little bit of a tiny taste of a quote unquote normal Comic Con. Um, but I found it interesting because uh, I was sitting at a table with somebody and there's another thing you could get a seat at a table. You weren't sitting on the floor. You weren't hugging a hall. Uh, you, you could actually walk up to a table and either a, it was empty or B say, uh, excuse me, is anybody sitting here? So yeah, it was, that was uh, nice. Um, but yeah, he, he had asked me if I, was disappointed and I could tell he was and I answered him honestly I said no I really wasn't expecting this to be a huge full-fledged Hollywood comic con I expected this to be artists art small press and highlights on comics and art that just really mostly that uh, the Hollywood that did show up like I said bonuses uh, the John Cena showing up uh, that was a welcome surprise, I think, for a lot of people. But uh, yeah, it it fit all. It checked all the u- <clears throat> excuse me usual Comic Con boxes. Yeah, it definitely did. Now, Sean, mm-hmm. I don't think anyone was more excited about Comic Con Special <laughs> Edition than you. Uh, and how did it stack up? Uh, it was great. I mean, it was pure joy to me. Um, it's interesting because the question I felt like when you first asked of like what we expected and was like thinking of how much that changed over time, because when it was first announced, I didn't really, I think I was probably not expecting it necessarily to happen um, just because yeah. we were, I mean, I hoped, you know, I always hoped, but we were in a place, I mean, when, you look at the last 12 months, I mean, yeah. there was a good chunk of the last 12 months that we weren't allowed to like eat outside at a McDonald's, you know? And so when this was, you know, announced even, we were just past the part where there was like caution tape at in and outs outside and things. And so it's kind of hard to imagine getting a convention. Then as we got further along, I mean, it was interesting because I hadn't put this together till we were at Comic-Con, but we had been to four shows that were pretty normal for the most part, but they were all folk, like there was an anime show in Animanga, there was a Halloween show in Midsummer Scream, there was PowerCon as a toy show, Designer Con is an art kind of toy show, but we hadn't been to like a comic convention type, you know, in, in that term. And so it was interesting kind of seeing the kind of going from show to show and so going into this of like what to expect um i think it it definitely exceeded my expectations for sure because as it became more clear that there was going to be a show um you know i just i as i said like i'd been happy if they just unlocked the convention center doors and we just walked inside and sat on the carpet or whatever so the fact that there was anything going on and that there was lots of friends there and that everybody we know as a vendor did exceedingly well yeah. was great yeah. to hear you know seeing the cosplay um the panels we went to we went to three and they were all fantastic and a lot of fun um the off sites as andy had said i was very surprised by those and it felt you know when we were in the peacemaker offsite it was like this is comic con it wasn't like it was comic con light it was just it was comic con and so um yeah i really was impressed with it quite a bit yeah so I want to talk, start by talking about the exhibit floor. And I mean, I spent most of the weekend, I feel like I was there because I spent basically the entire weekend watching it on Twitter and it looked like the crowds were decent, but do you think there was a good turnout? You spend more time on the floor than I think any of us. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, for a comic convention, it was an exceedingly good turnout from what we've seen. If we're looking at like 2018, 2019, all of that Um, in the face in, in this year, I mean, like Anna manga had literally like a three hour wait to get into the convention. So, I mean, it was a smaller convention center, but it was huge crowds to get in. So we've seen big crowds pretty much everywhere we go since June, whether it's parks or conventions and stuff. So, that but this one I was really surprised by how consistently there would be people there like Sunday it was still people there and so it was never crowded like a San Diego Comic Con you know normally but it was right. just there was always like a lifeblood going and that surprised me because most Comic Cons that we go to 
have a really light Sunday, you know, like a really empty Sunday, a lot of times and really light, you know, and this definitely was much more vibrant kind of from start to close than a lot of the ones I think we go to pre pandemic. And we'll see, cause as I said, for like a comic con, we're going to go to LA this weekend, but this is the first one we've been to like this since, yeah. you know, things have reopened. What about the rest of you? Were the crowds and the attendees about what you expected or no? Uh, I think I think so. I mean, like I said, it was it was easy to move around. There was never really any any issue with that. Um, there were lines. Uh, some of the vendors had some decent lines. Uh, uh -huh. Some of the panels had some lines. But I mean, if you go to a comic convention of any sort, you can expect there to be lines for something. Yeah. Uh, I mean, very few uh, cons these days don't have a decent enough attendance for the most popular things to have lines for them. Yeah. But nothing seemed really horrible. And like, like you know, being able to find a table at one of the lounges is Amazing. just insane. Yeah. yeah. Like anytime you wanted to, you just had to go looking and like, oh, there's one over there. I'll go sit down. Absolutely. So Sean kind of touched on this a little bit, but so many of the vendors I've talked to had just absolutely amazing weekends. Like they were saying they sold way more than they thought they would. They sold more than they normally do at WonderCon. What do you guys think is attributed to that? Like, is it just that none of us have been to a convention in so long that we're all just like, oh my God, like, please just take my money. Like, I'm just so excited to spend. Well, it's almost part of the uh, time of the year the placement right on Black Friday, even um, okay. getting those gifts that was in a lot of people's minds. You know, you guys were promoting go to the small, go to the small vendors, go to the artists, get, get, a, yep. get your handmade items. Um, and it was, the, I, I believe those were areas were a lot bigger than before. And then a few vendors I even talked to, um, they were just so excited to be there for the first time they could get their foot in the door. Absolutely. Did anybody have a favorite booth from over the weekend? Uh, I'm actually going to echo what uh, Kim said in that it was great seeing a lot of first timers who were it, intensely grateful to just be there. Uh, they were just, it was their Christmas. They, they were ecstatic. Um, and for me, it was weird because it's the first comic con that I've been to. And I've only been going since, uh, 2012 so not i'm not the the actual seasoned veterans that some people are but it's actually the first one i went to where i could put my arms straight out and not actually touch another human being and not have another human being touch me it was it was unreal i i, I don't think i've ever had that at even at wondercon um but yeah definitely uh the vendors were happy to be there. I talked with Dane and the group from Monkey Minion. They were so happy to be back. So many people were talking about it was like a family reunion. They haven't seen people in a long time. They were seeing again, you know, and that's with all of you guys who, who were there. You know, I, I haven't seen most of you since what, 2019. So it was great to see all of you again. I, I was thrilled. You know, um, I, oh, go ahead, Sean. No, I was just going to say on the shopping side of things too, is like one thing on the, I'm not, sh I'm sure it's the same with a lot of the different vendors, but I know like on the comic and toy side, I mean, when the pandemic began, like we, Carmel and I were really focusing on like trying to do online orders from different shops that we loved because they were forced to be closed and we're like, they're not going to survive. They're not going to be around. Well, the comic and toy market exploded. Like yeah. those places had record years uh, because a lot of people got, you know, whether it was, you know, they're able to keep working because they're frontline or because they were work from home. There were stimulus checks coming. So people all of a sudden filled in all these comic holes. So it's kind of funny, like the LA times article about like comics, not going, it's like, those are shops we, I mean, I can't speak for them, but I know they've done really good business too. So I don't think they really needed to go. Now those markets are starting to slow up some now that people are starting to vacation again and things like that. But I think it's exactly that idea though, is there's a lot of people that hadn't bought a blind box, you know, a giant blind box from Stylin in two years. And they're like, I'm going to, I know a lot of people in general. Also, there was a lot of reflection during the time of being locked up of like, 
you know, well, I always wanted to go get that, you know, buy a t-shirt from the giant tower or whatever it is, you know, these <laughs> silly little things. I know I was like, I'm never going to see Alan Oppenheimer again. There were so many times I didn't want to pay $50 to get Skeletor's autograph. And then when I saw him at PowerCon, it's like, I got to get his autograph. There's no chance I'm letting this go again. Cause now he's there. So I do think there was a lot of that of, there was this time that was saved and now it was like, okay, let's, you know, let's time, go with yeah. it and let's do some shopping. Yeah, I think I think so many factors went into that. Um, the the need for people to go and spend money at a, at a con because that's what they've missed being at a con, going and shopping. There's no Hall H line or Ballroom Twenty line that's holding ten thousand people away from the show floor. So nothing was holding people away from the show floor. They had a chance to go and shop for the first time if they normally went and stood in line for panels. Um, so. You combine all of those things, and I think that's probably, you know, that's all of that combines to vendors having a great show. Yeah, absolutely. Do you guys have a favorite item that you purchased over the weekend? Or a favorite booth that you visited? Booth I mean, is Toddland, but I, I did my ordering online, oh, so I didn't get any. <laughs> I didn't get, but I loved his booth, and then he made it snow. Snow, it yes. Snow. So magical. <laughs> yeah. So good job to him and, and the Toddland team. Yes. He texted me like Wednesday night. He's like, I brought a snow machine, but you can't tell anyone. So I was just waiting. <laughs> and then uh, I was yeah. like visiting the Brown Coat booth. I'm sorry. Um, no. I, that's, I have history of volunteering there way back when. And it's just so good to always see him. Um, faces keep changing, but, you know, same stuff, same look. And they had our pretzel updates, so, you know. <laughs> yes, they did. Yes, they did. Anybody else? Uh, I mean, we bought um, three Doctor Who art prints from Jason Palmer. Um, nice. Which, you know, one 10, 11, and 12. Uh, but I think we really didn't do that much shopping. Being there only one day, we did mostly walking around and doing prize mule and yeah. talking with people. And so we didn't even buy anything, I think, until almost the end of the show. <laughs> Uh, the upper deck uh, booth really, uh, really impressed me. They had great stuff there. The uh, their exclusive was uh, very sought after. It was very popular, and uh, I, I actually went back and bought myself one of those packs, and I bought myself a one of those play mats. Uh, it's absolutely perfect for for ex right here what we're doing right now. So uh, yeah, they they got me, and uh, my other one was Beefy Joseph. Um, I don't know. I'm sorry. Um, dang it, <laughs> I always get him and Beefy and Company mixed up. But uh, no, he. Uh, I, I stopped oh, by fuzzy. his booth. Fuzzy, fuzzy thank you, thank you. Fuzzy Beefy, I, I get them confused. I don't know why. But anyway, I uh, I stopped at his booth and I got a chance to talk to him because I had recognized him from uh, the commissions posts. He was so happy to be there and uh, so grateful to be among people that you know it, it was it was a pleasure to talk to him so yeah and I, of course I, I love his comics so it was good sean do you have an answer you uh yeah there are um, a friend of ours steve had a booth there and he's always he's a huge comic con fan and he definitely has helped me a lot in the last year or two because he's i think uh was as excited as i was to be there and stuff but he actually had a booth there he sells vintage toys and things like that um and so he was excited of you know being an exhibitor at comic con so that was so cool to see him having that experience uh and then got a vintage uh skeletor from him which is something i've wanted to get for a really long long time so that was kind of that was like our first stop when we got onto the floor so that was uh very meaningful in a lot of ways it was just uh kind of cool on a lot of levels there's also some good um comic booths there i mean comics are always more expensive in general at at any convention because yeah. they have to pay for the space same as brick yeah. and mortar so that's understandable and stuff um but uh, i picked up a fantastic four 107 which was just it was 20 bucks it's more probably in the shape it was it's probably more of a 10 or 15 dollar book but it was just a really nice cool cover you know a green uh you know 70s or 60s i guess cover and just it was it was just nice to be back in that kind of environment and buying an old comic in that kind yeah. of setting too 
Absolutely. So let's talk about Funko. Now, I know that Sean went through the standby line, but Kim, I think you were the only one who actually did the morning cubes of deciding things. Cubes so for- of deciding. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so for anybody who has no idea what we're talking about, why don't you just tell us like what that process was like and how you, if you liked it or if you didn't. Yeah. So that was the longest line I stood in um, the whole weekend, but it was still super fast. And I got there about 8.30 and then, or maybe probably closer to eight. And then we were moving in well before nine. So maybe 8.45, the line started moving. Um, and then a, another wait in the, um, the shoots inside and they went row by row and they had a good number of the cubes, um, which were a lot smaller <laughs> than I expected, but uh, uh, so maybe, maybe 10 set up and um, you got to hit it and it was red or green mine was red <laughs> but the uh drive comic-con if you go with the group we had one person who got green so she was able to go in nice. during the day and she did not want the wooden toucan so i was able to she got that for me so thank you shannon nice. and um <laughs> so you know that's how comic-con works out so he's up on the shelf behind me and uh that was a very easy process and then you know we found out friday that they opened they had standby yeah. um the next day, the lines was a bit longer for standby, but, you know, I went through it. So maybe that was like a half hour wait later in the day and um, got some of the, got the Wonder Woman. I think this is so interesting because it's basically, I mean, they basically used to do this up in sales just with like a draw. Right. And then they moved to the online lottery and now it's kind of like, well, we're going back to the old system. So I don't know. I mean, James and Sean, I think you guys are the two who probably ever did the sales stuff. Do you guys hope that this is the process for Comic-Con? What do you think? I think Sean might have a better answer than me. Um, I mean, generally just in in life with all things and i know it's a compliment i'm i have gone on record for a million years now i just am not a fan of lotteries at all for anything at comic-con or anywhere else in life like i still feel like if you're gonna have a lottery for exclusives you do lottery for hall h and lottery for ball and i just feel like if you do lottery you do lottery for everything so i'm never a fan of lottery that's under that said I understand. And since the lottery system that Comic-Con's had, I mean, we've really lucked out and gotten things we never would have. So I feel like I'm in a good spot to still say I still vote against it, even though we've gotten a lot of things that we wouldn't have gotten before. Yeah. Um, I just don't like the idea of the luck. But as far back as I can remember going to Comic-Con, there's been bags with, you know, black and white, you know, little balls in them or dice or thing, you know, things so of, yep. cho- of chance. And so it's not like it's a, an altogether new thing. I really thought the, the cube thing was a neat idea. We didn't, uh, we just, there wasn't anything Funko had that was a big enough deal to us to spend time yeah. over there. So you actually, thank you to you for letting me know that you had seen that they had a standby because we were able to just walk over and get the red, uh, we got the red uh, toucan. And it's like, okay, that's good. That's our, our toucan for the weekend. We don't need all the toucans. And it took like two minutes and we were in and, and out of it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think probably Comic-Cons come to the place. I know with Lego, with all of them, that probably lotteries are here to stay. They'll always be there. But you, yeah, to me, then you might as well just do it online. But obviously, if you're doing it online. Now, in the case of this weekend, as James was saying, without having like a big hall h to pull people into it was kind of nice because this did pull everybody off to the side rather than it being like an online lottery so it's like okay take this big chunk of people give them something to do for a while and then they can come out and you know spend their money elsewhere yeah what about the rest of you i mean james i know you at least have done some of the lego stuff are you do would you rather have the online lottery or would you rather have a stand up and wait and still have a lottery, but with less people in person. I, I don't have a problem with the lottery like like Sean, um, mainly because I, I don't think that it's, I don't like, I, I understand where he comes from on it because it's like you put in the effort, you get the reward. The yeah. problem at Comic-Con is, is there's 100,000 people wanting to do that and they yeah. can't manage that. Yeah. So uh, I think the lottery is really the only solution that is fair, if you want to call it fair. And so I think the online lottery is probably the only way to go moving forward because as has been shown in the past before they moved to it, the in-person lottery back behind sales 
also is not fair because of all the people who cheated their way in or did yeah. something to gain the system. So with the online one, that's the way they, so if they're going to have a lottery, it needs to be an online lottery, not in person um, at a, at a big show, like normal July comic-con at a show like this. I don't think it was as big a deal because there yeah. weren't so many people that were trying so hard to see, get whatever advantage they could. Um, yeah. Like maybe we'll see the cubes again at WonderCon. Yeah. But for comic-con now, I, I think, I think that there's, there's no going back from an online lottery because that it's the fairest, you know, way to make it even across the board for anyone who wants to give it a try. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've gotten things that looks like, like Sean, I've gotten things in the lottery. I never would have. Cause I, I, I just didn't want to put in the day's worth of effort. It, it would take in some cases. Kim, Andy, do either of you have, you want to chime in on any of this? Well, I just think that uh, it's interesting to, uh, take into account that at the end of the day on Sunday, Funko still had stuff left. You know, they still had all the toucans left. They still had basically everything they came with. Um, so as James was saying, yeah, there really wasn't as much of a demand or as many people clamoring uh, to get all to get the same thing. Uh, they opened it up just there was no standby after one o'clock on Sunday. So you could just walk up to Funko and uh, buy a toucan if you wanted. Um, they put limits on it, but yeah, that was really it. So I, I was, it, I, I, th I thought it was uh, refreshing this year. And I'm kind of with Sean. Um, I kind of maybe like James said, maybe not for July Comic-Con, but I, I appreciate that this does take people you know, you decide what you want to spend your time doing. I got in the upper deck line and I said, no, nah, I don't want to spend my time getting this exclusive. It's okay. Um, but, you know, I decided I wanted to try for the wooden Funko, for example. So yeah. it, this lines um, allow you to choose what you want to do and gets people away so that everyone has a chance to do something else or their own thing, really. Absolutely. So let's talk about what is arguably the biggest change for this convention, which is obviously this time around, you had to prove that you were either vaccinated or a negative test. Um, Andy, why don't we start with you and just how was that process for you? It was, well, for me, I went early on Tuesday, the, basically the first opportunity that you could go to get uh, your badge. So there weren't that many people there at all. Uh, but then again, it wasn't very clearly signed as to which station was for exhibitors or which was for general attendees. Now, I happened to be walking past the station at uh, Hall D and I looked at it and I thought there's nothing that says that there, there's nothing that doesn't say that I can't go up. And I thought the worst that that's going to happen is they're going to send me down to H. So I walked up. I asked, hey, is this where you go? The woman behind the counter looked kind of confused for a second. But then she turned to the person next to her who said, yep, just take him. He's good to go. Boom, done. It took maybe 10 seconds. They put the wristband on me and I, I was on my way. But yeah, it wasn't clearly designated, although there was a vibe. <laughs> yeah. So I don't to know to clarify what Andy's talking about is there were two stations. There was one by H there was one by D they both just basically said like, go here to get your wristband. Um, and as far as I am aware, no one, including the volunteers who were working that booth. Cause I talked to one of them, uh, was aware that the one at D was really supposed to be exhibitors until like Saturday when some of the exhibitors started showing up and started getting annoyed that like they had to stand in line. And then it was like, Oh no, actually this is supposed to be for exhibitors only. Um, and it's my understanding that they've been like changed and they've made new signage and all that. But that's what Andy's talking about. Uh, Sean, I mean, how was the process for you? Quick, easy? Uh, yeah, I mean, for the most part, we were probably at the worst time to go because it was Friday morning, so we just couldn't get there on Tuesday or Wednesday yeah. and Thursday. It was closed, so it was kind of the peak time. We were concerned about it, not knowing what the system would be, so we got there 
what, at eight in the morning, 8.30, something like mm -hmm. that, pretty early. And we actually did get our wristbands at D and there was just all a mix of people and there was no yeah. no one saying that that wasn't the place to go. But it was, it was in general pretty easy. I mean, I know it got messy a little while after that for a while, um, but yeah, for the most part, easy. Yeah. So do we think that this will be a process that will be in place for San Diego Comic-Con. I mean, obviously, again, it just depends on like the world and what the situation is. But what I keep wondering is if they do it this way for Comic-Con, does that mean that our badges won't get mailed and we'll have to go pick them up on site? James, what do you think? I, I think that's, I think that's most likely uh, because if you have to pick up your badge, then you have to get checked, yep. uh, you know, and they, you know, you can't go and just look and see, like, if you're showing up later on Thursday you, or whatever, you can't see the, what the people are showing on pictures online on Wednesday and uh, print your own ribbon, you know? So um, I think that if they need to do it, that they're going to hold them all there and do badge pickup. I have no idea where, uh, because Hall H will be Hall H at yep. Comic-Con. Um, I, I assume that they will maybe use uh, one of the hotels or something upstairs in sales to have a process and they'll figure it out. Uh, yeah. I know that they will have a lot more uh, stations handling it so they can get through a lot faster. Um, so I mean, it, it, and I, so I went on, as, as mentioned, I went on Saturday only, so I had to do everything on Saturday. And that's when they had figured things out that, you know, how many people were coming and what they needed in specific areas to staff. I talked to someone who had gone to D um, on Saturday to try and get their wristband and they were told that this is exhibitors only and to go to H. So they had yeah. definitely informed volunteers by that point. Uh, when we got in line around 10 a.m., um, it was maybe 40 people in line consistently showing up to get checked and they had at least six people checking and at least four people handing out the wristbands. So it went really fast. We were in line for maybe three minutes. Yeah. Um, and then we were going in to get our badge, which took no time as well, because most of it happened on Friday. So I think it was fine. Uh, there was nothing wrong with it. There was nothing bad about it. It's just, I can see that those going on Friday, having that confusion of D and H and maybe not enough people to do the checking to where the line backed up. Um, they'll, they'll figure those things out for the next time they have to do it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we always say that the point, like, we always joke that they call it WonderCon because they try things out there and they say, gee, I wonder what would happen if we did this at San Diego Comic-Con. Let's try this at WonderCon. <laughs> so this is just another trial run. Andy, you've had your hand up for a while. So. Yeah, I was just uh, saying that if they wanted to, if they were still going to mail badges out, uh, the best way that they could still have attendees get checked first is to tie everything to the RFID. So they didn't use RFID this time, but if they have your COVID check and you have to get your thing scanned to have it activated to go into the convention center, that might be something they consider. Yeah. Um, but again, like you said, we honestly have no idea what they're going to do or yeah. if this is going to last even till WonderCon. Um, also, I wanted to point out that uh, James Binder asked in the chat if uh, the red slash green bands were intentional. Uh, Carrie, I'm going to let you <laughs> answer that. We, because, we don't. Uh, we don't know. That, that I was, mean, that was going on. Like with anything at Comic Con, I mean, you can ask five different people and get five different answers. So at one point, uh, one of our staffers was told that the green was for a negative vaccine test, and the red was for uh, actually vaccinated. But then she went back another day and they told her something different and they told other people different things. So honestly, we don't even know like why they had two different colored wristbands. Like who knows? Um, I also wanted to mention real quick, Amy H in the chat also said, definitely hope they get better wristbands for the summer. Uh, definitely. I can see all of yeah. you, if not at your heads. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say one thing with, with that for sure. Yeah. I mean, designer con used nice plastic ones that you could mm -hmm. wipe down and it was, like, yeah, that's the way to go if you're going to do those super multi-day cons. Um, so this weekend, LA Comic Con, they are mailing badges 
Um, but there is the vaccine requirement. And so my understanding is the vaccine or negative test uh, check is part of the security process. Now, Comic-Con doesn't do the bag checks like most of the, the cons we go to. So it's a, you know, a whole different story there, but that's how they seem to be handling it. Or at least that's what our understanding is right now. So we'll see you this weekend. Absolutely. I wanted to um, bring up, the question was actually asked in the talkback panel um, about why there were wristbands at all for the COVID checks and the Comic-Con representative, um, not David, I couldn't read her name tag, but um, so I, I don't know her name offhand, but she said that uh, you do want, you know, the badges can be given away. You want the wristband to follow the person. So I think, yeah, badges can be mailed for WonderCon, yeah. Comic-Con, and then you just get checked and you can't enter without, you know, your COVID wristband. And I did appreciate um, my, my wristband was also falling off. The lines were so short the rest of the weekend, you could just go up and get a new one. Yeah. So that, at least that was that. Absolutely. So I think the biggest takeaway there is please give us plastic wristbands, Comic-Con, please. Uh, <laughs> okay, so let's talk offsites. And honestly, I think one of the biggest surprises of this entire con was that not only were there offsites, but there were three decent ones. Uh, Kim? Why don't you tell us a little bit about them? It was such a surprise. I show up Monday and what? Why there's grass here in this the NBC area is. Did NBC said say something? Um, so that was a shock and a very just that was just very exciting to have all those. Um, funny enough, there were only three offsites. I only went to two of them, um, so I didn't make it over to the uh, Freak Brothers one. Um, so I think Andy did. You can maybe talk about that, but the. La Brea was great. I, you can collect water bottles all day long, um, sci-fi bags, and then Peacemaker um, just exceeded everything. And I did it twice because it's one, you know, one of those things where um, you're not going to see it again. Might as well do it, do it twice. So for those who didn't go through Peacemaker, like what, what, what did you do in that? Uh, they um, were a bit rude to you, which I think follows the show, and gave you a Nerf gun and um, had you shoot at various th people, um, gnomes. flying gnomes. The gnomes were, I'm latched onto the gnomes as well as the cubes of deciding. So <laughs> uh, it was a neat obstacle course that, you know, was accessible and easy to do. So it was just a lot of fun and got people through it really quickly so that they, they must have thought about timing and the line. Um, I did wait a while a second day, but I think they were having shift change, but usually just maybe a 40 minute wait at the most. And then they had free food at the food truck. So Which was awesome. Perfect. Yeah. Andy, you went to Freak Brothers. What was that like? Uh, that was actually a really great spot because uh, they actually had a lounge. Uh, their offsite was just basically uh, an RV yeah. that uh, you could sit in. You well, you could sit outside. You could charge your phone. They had a ton of phone chargers there for uh, Apple and just about everything else. Um, the people there were great. They were giving out, you know, mints. Uh, they had some posters for uh, the Freak Brothers show, and uh, it was just it was it was very relaxing which i think we all know can be very very important at comic-con it was so fun to like watch on twitter and see like all of these amazing offsites right now the line is like five minutes long <laughs> like following along at home it was like that's the dream so i'm glad you guys all got to do that <laughs> <That's> uh, <laughs> sean <laughs> i think you went to all three right we did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, the Freak Brothers one, it was just the, it was hard for them with the foot traffic. It was such a cool setup and spot and it's in such an amazing location during a normal Comic Con. But I think because there weren't the big, you know, there weren't the lines obviously out there, there weren't, you know, so it was just every time yeah. we went by there, they were kind of having a hard time pulling people over there. Um, La Brea was uh, a neat, you know, just a bunch of different photo ops and those little bags and stuff. Peacemaker definitely was the highlight for me because it was so yeah. interactive and it was it, you know, it wasn't quite what the boys did at Amazon, you know, a while ago, but it was in that vein and it's that yeah. kind of humor and things like that. Re very irreverent and um, just a ton of fun. Yeah. And, and well, even just the rap. I mean, 
the the wrap on the Marriott. I mean, I know it's a small one, but that was neat to see too. It just was all these like little pieces of, you know, Comic Con that we haven't had, obviously. Yeah, for a while. the fact that we got any of this. Cause I mean, honestly, mm-hmm. if you had asked me like last weekend, like, will there be offsides? I'd have been like, absolutely not. Uh, so it was, <laughs> it was really nice just to like see all of this stuff just like pop up at the last minute. So I, and think I don't think we awesome. even, I don't think we even knew about the pinball lounge until I saw it in the program guide. I don't think so. Yeah, so that was I, I don't remember hearing um, about that either. But uh, well, um, the Freak Brothers was actually over by where uh, Fox usually is, uh, between the convention center and the Hilton. So during a normal quote unquote Comic Con, um, I, I they would have gotten a lot more foot traffic, and I think it would have been a really big draw because once again, it's a place to charge your phone and it's a place for you to sit down and, and rest for a little bit. Absolutely. Again, I mean, just watching from home, it was like, this is the offsite, like San Diego Comic Con experience. We all wish, like, offsites where you can sit and with no line, like, does not get better than that. So, speaking of Peacemaker, though, we also got surprise John Cena. And <laughs> James and Cam, I think you were both there for that moment. And then Sean, you caught him at the offsite after. Um, Somebody talk about just what that experience was like of just, we've been hearing this entire time, like there's not going to be Hollywood there. Like, and then all of a sudden, like, Hey, it's John Cena. Well, it was pretty awesome. Um, So I was at the masquerade because for the first time ever, I actually had time to go. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Because, you know, at normal Comic-Con, you have to get a ticket and those are gone. Like, yeah. by noon that day or something like that. If you want to go in the room that the, the masquerade is being held in, which why wouldn't you? Yeah. Um, and we're always doing something else on a Saturday. I mean, it's the busiest day. And so we never get to go. So it was like, well, let's go. And all we had to do was go and line up. There was no tickets or anything. We lined up like we, we were basically done with everything we wanted to do. So we lined up like 45 minutes or an hour early. Something. Yeah, like I was going to say you only lined up like an hour early, I think. And, and the line was already like almost all the way down the hallway that they normally line ballroom 20 in. And uh, it ended up pretty long after in that hour after we got in line, because there was a lot of, I think the room uh, was about 90 to 95% full by by the time the the show started. And then, you know, they're doing the normal intros and everything. And then all of a sudden they just stop everything for, you know, for the, the presentation. And he was awesome. I mean, it's, it's really great when someone like coming from the Hollywood thing comes in and does something that is appreciative of the crowd they're in front of and coming in full costume and talking about, you know, talking about the fans. That was a great thing. And it was just great to see. And, you know, I'm actually really sad that there's, it was both happy, sad, because I think I might have wanted to see what Sean got to see at the offsite more because that looked like it was it looks pretty fun. Funner. And it also did. maybe longer. <laughs> so, Sean, what did you get to see? Actually, no, Kim. Yeah, Kim. Kim. I she think was at, Kim, the, at the first part. Kim might have been one of the only. I think maybe Kim was the only person that saw, saw both. both. Was that possible, Kim? <laughs> it is. I could, because my little brain, my little Comic Con brain, was like, "Well, if he's here and there's a Peacemaker offsite, maybe I should go see what's happening now at the Peacemaker offsite after he left the stage." So I did leave the masquerade, went down to, or excuse me, Peacemaker, and um. And indeed, there were a lot more people there, the whole big crowd of, um, and apparently it was influencers. And I just found today, I tracked it down and they're on um, the tag HBO partner on the TikTok. And they, uh, a bunch of influencers went through the offsite and ran into him. So we were able to just stand there on, you know, the sidewalk right there. You guys are familiar with it right by the um, Hilton Thank you, Hilton Gas Lamp, <laughs> and uh, watch them do their little bits. But you know, he took photos with them, and um, the Eagle. I now know more about Peacemaker Please. than I ever did before, um, having Which gone is the point. Past weekend. So now I want to see the show. So yes, it worked, and you know, just amazing that um, HBO and Warner and Comic Con kept that as an amazing secret and a surprise for the masquerade crowd. It was just just one of those moments, just so cool. Absolutely. It's, it's the kind of thing that you would expect something would leak. Yeah. Somewhere, you know. 
especially it being at Comic-Con where nothing else on that scale is happening, you know, th someone somewhere you'd think would leak something. <laughs> and that was one of the most surreal parts. Cause like, see, so we, yeah, we weren't at, we weren't able to see the panel and then very grateful James and Beth got video for us. And so we still had video for our YouTube channel. Stuff, so that was awesome. And we were dealing with like getting it uploaded, all that. And we saw Kim and Kim was going over there. And, uh, you know, as a little aside, you know, like I live in perpetual pain with my feet. Like I've had lots of surgeries on my feet. So I'm just always in pain. So I was really like, yeah, I just don't have it in me to go over there. But Carmel's like, no, it makes sense to go there. And Kim was already over there and like, all right, after we got, so we went over there. And then that was so awesome because, yeah, we got six, seven, eight minutes of him just interacting with these people. And one of the most surreal parts was. I think we're all used to Comic Con seeing celebrities do things and get their photos taken and the PR thing. But what I had never experienced really, and what Kim and Carmel and I had, is it was like it was Kim, Carmel, me, and like two other people outside the ropes like there was no battling to get photos because it was just us standing next to each other and it's like Random John costumes. Cena's there but yeah everybody else was either at home or in the you know in the uh, masquerade or wherever but there was nobody running over to try to you know storm the the castle or whatever and so Again, the that was very dream. strange <laughs> yeah it was it was very strange to just be able to stand there right even move, and i even moved like to the right to get like a better shot because there was no one on the rope there and it was just like it was like our own little private show or something like that that's so awesome i'm so glad you guys got to experience that that's really cool um, so let's talk about the programming. And the programming was arguably a little bit light, let's be honest. Uh, but it felt from Twitter that that let a lot of these smaller panels like really shine. Like that X-Men fandom panel. I mean, that I feel like that was like one of the most popular panels of the weekend. And I that would obviously not happen at San Diego Comic-Con. So that was really cool. Did you guys go to any panels? Someone take it Someone away. besides me. Kim, I Kim, I know you. I did. Work. I did. And it was, it was wonderful. And um, I did try to go, the first one I tried to go to was Brent Spiner. And granted, I think I was like five minutes before the panel. So that was completely full, of course. But um, so, but yeah, it, a lot of small panels, they're all small. They're all in small rooms. Um, but because I guess the flow of the crowd, oh, most of them are very easy to get into. Yeah, um, yeah. I went to... The VHX, VF, the FX of Doctor Who, um, like how to do it yourself. And it, uh, the panelists, um, all veterans in the industry, but they put on the screen a clip from 60s or 70s Doctor Who, where it was, and it was like, how do you do this at home? They asking the panelists, but it was like, you take some bubble wrap and some green slime, or here's a tube of, you know, cardboard tube. So it was, they, um, it was just really fun to go through this. It was just, it was a riot because of the thing, the materials that they were like, oh yeah, they had that cardboard tube there, some PVC well, pipe. Oh, you know, granted, that wasn't, how do you recreate this at home? This was, you know, as in, you know, doing it on a budget. This was, this is how Doctor Who did it in the 60s mm -hmm. and 70s. And we're recreating it exactly. <laughs> So that was a great, that was just, you know, nothing I would have ever gone to except it said Doctor Who and this is fun, easy to stop in. And then I went to a Tiki panel, which kind of melds my world because I went to Tiki Oasis um, convention over the summer. And that was just a lot of artists. Uh, I think I gravitated towards the artist panels um, and a lot of uh, learning how to do things, how to time manage, um, really interesting content that I took a lot away, a lot away from. Um, and it's panels that you probably would have never had time for at San Diego. So, yeah. <clears throat> no, I think, I mean, I think maybe we'll talk about it later. The issue I had was finding these panels. So no. yes, yes. We, we will get to that. Okay. <laughs> Andy, did you go to any panels? Uh, no, actually I didn't personally go to any panels, but the reactions that I heard from people were again, all around generally positive. Uh, I, I personally appreciate that. Uh, like I see here in the chat, Alex Acosta went to Scott Shaw's oddball comics panel. So yeah, this would be 
this this was a great opportunity for panels like that, like you were saying, Carrie, to get more attention or arguably the, the attention they may deserve. Yeah. Now, Sean, I'm, I think you went to a couple panels, right? Yeah, I was going to say, is this possible that I went to the most panels? I think and you I did. Mean, like, not a panel person <laughs> in general, but uh, the panels, yeah, they were really great. And they were actually, all three were panels I would like to go to. Normally, it would have been, yeah, if, it, how, if there would have been time, obviously, with all the different demands and stuff. Uh, the Nacelle Company, who, like, the toys that made us, the movies that made us, uh, behind the attractions on Disney Plus with The Rock, all of that, they were there. Um, and they did a great panel. They looked a little bit pa- back and a little bit forward of stuff they're doing with, like, consumer products now, and they're launching their own toys lines and things and that was a lot of fun um brent spiner was after that went to that panel um that felt really good he was incredible and it it had been a long time since it'd been in a panel like that where it was just one person kind of dominating with their humor and wit and you know you know playing off the audience and calling people and you know giving people a hard time for doing video or whatever and it was he, he gave the uh, moderator such a hard time too and a good night. I've seen him on group panels, but I've never seen him just on his own. And he was there yeah. promoting fan fiction, his uh, book now. And so that was awesome. And then um, on Saturday, saw the story of Comic-Con, yeah. telling the story of Comic-Con which was basically about uh, the docu, the podcast series this summer, uh, Comic-Con Begins begins, and kind of how they put that together. Um, And they had, uh, you know, a few of the founders there as well that kind of gave some of their perspective. So it kind of, it kind of lets you know if you didn't listen to the podcast a little bit, what was touched on there. And then kind of a highlight was just that they had announced that there's a companion book coming, which I'm sure will be beautiful, filled with lots of, you know, vintage Comic-Con pictures called See You in San Diego. And that is hopefully going to be out, uh, hopefully, obviously, by Comic-Con 22, but depending on supply chain, all that stuff. So, but it, but all three panels were really good. But again, yeah, they were very tiny rooms. And so you kind of, like, if we weren't there a good little chunk before, it seemed like it just wasn't going to happen, probably. Yeah. So here in a minute, we're going to talk about our favorite and a couple of not so favorite things uh, about Comic-Con Special Edition. But first, I want to get to a couple of reader questions. So James asked, as a lotto loyalist, how bad were the lines for those randomizer cubes? Uh, I mean, they didn't seem bad at all from Twitter. In fact, one person said they had time to go through it four times. (laughs) So (laughs) uh, what what do you guys think? Would you agree with that? Not bad in comparison to San Diego Comic Con. Yeah, yeah, a lot easier. I, I wouldn't do it if I didn't think I could get through it. So I didn't try the second time. Um, maybe that would have been a little more of a wait, maybe a little less of a wait. But um, my friend did it Sunday and he said, and he did it twice. And yeah, and that was like 930. So the floor just opened at nine. So he was already yeah. through it twice. So yeah, like I said, so if, I'm like, if you have time to go through it four times, as someone tweeted us that they did, uh, it's not that bad. Um, Micah Chan Cosplay asked, hi, you guys. I just wanted to ask, did any of you guys go to the masquerade? We know that Kim and James did. If so, what did you think? I was the second contestant and to perform, I was the League of Legends Ari. I hope I said that right. Did you stay long enough or did you leave right after the intro, Kim? No, I see. I saw a few. So I think I, I saw, um, I saw you. <laughs> it was uh, uh, so much bravery to get up there. And that, that's the biggest room. So yeah, um, yeah. yeah it, and I, it was so much fun. <laughs> and then they went stayed. to like a side stage for like, like a press area. Yeah, there was a press thing where you go afterwards, <laughs> like you won an award, no matter what you got to go and everyone took your picture, you know, it was, it was really cool. That's cool. Um, but I left maybe an hour or so in. Uh, I got called away. Um, we well, had to drive home. Well, and I had to drive home. Yes, uh, <laughs> we can. We won't. We won't talk about that driving thing. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think I saw maybe around fifteen or twenty of them, and it was nice. it was great. And there, and I actually, I'm really sad that I left when I did because I left just as Freddie Mercury as Hulk oh. was starting. Um, I mean, I only saw it from Twitter, but if you have not like seen the song that that dude sang, it was hysterical. So I so. We were we were like walking as he was introduced. So as I was walking away, I stopped for a second, turned around and shot a few pictures of him coming out. 
and then we walked out and I could hear him singing as we were walking out. So I was like, oh man, wish we could have stayed. Love before um, the best one, yeah. But I hope this is something that Comic-Con can, can get on their YouTube. You know, I hope they do. Yes. You know, they, they might not well. do all the panels, but that would be wonderful. We hadn't been to, since we hadn't been before, we didn't, we weren't aware that the performance aspect of it was a significant portion of what they do. It's not just, you know, hey, look at my costume. It's like getting into character. Sometimes there's like little skits or performances like Freddie Mercury as the Hulk. So uh, I had heard something like that, but until you experience it, you you know, you don't, you don't know. understand yeah. just what these people are putting into it. And um, it's really nice seeing that, you know, the, both the person in the costume and the people who, you know, whoever's uh, designed it always get the acknowledgement uh, of every single, you know, costume that comes out. So uh, I, it was just a really fun. And I, I mean, I hope I get to go to another one and have time for another one in the future, because that actually is a fun time. I can see why it's so packed every single year. Absolutely. So let's go down the line and talk about our favorite things over the weekend and just about the convention in general. And let's start with Andy. Well, uh, I had mentioned before that almost all of the quote unquote comic con boxes got checked, including all the weird stuff. And, and that's, that's honestly what I love most about comic con. Um, the first day uh, I walked, I was walking up. Um, I asked somebody who looked like he was standing in a line, what he was in line for. And he said, I don't know. And I said to him, but you're standing in line. He says, yep. I said, okay, you're just, you're standing in a line and you don't know what it's for. Awesome. So that was number one. Number two, we had the whole Mario Kart thing. That was my personal favorite. And for those of you who don't know, somebody dressed up as Mario pulled up to the convention center in a little Mario Kart. They played and, music. Yeah. And got stopped by a cop. That was, that was the best part. You see the cop leaning over this dude in a little cart. Um, but yeah, there was a nut job with a megaphone yelling at people. Uh, so yeah, it was, it, it was like a, that tiny slice of comic con that really made it feel like we were back to getting back to doing things that we used to do. You know, obviously we're, we're not all the way back. We're still, we still got a ways to go, but it's, it's one more step in the right direction. And to me, it's very encouraging. Absolutely. Kim, what about you? What were some of your favorite things? Yeah, it goes, I mean, it goes without saying, seeing everyone most that I haven't seen since last Comic-Con in 2019, um, even if it was, yeah. and before a few, few people I ran into, um, I don't even know when I last saw them. And even it was, if it was just a quick, Hi, hello, how you doing? Um, it was just so nice. <laughs> it was an amazing feeling. I um, I got recognized and I wanted to give a shout out to Shaquana who who knew me from, I think this from a Comcast because it's the only place I put my face out. So if you're watching, I wanted to say hello and thank you for stopping to say hi. And awesome. uh, um, same, like all the prize mule players. Thank you to them. Uh, yeah. So much fun, even if it's like really heavy to carry all that stuff around all day long. Mule, tell, mule like, aspects. Is please, real. please know that I tell every vendor, like, <laughs> don't give us much. Like, we don't want much. And then every time they give us like so much stuff. I'm like, so it, that's uh, such a great chance just to say hi to people I don't even know um, who see our tweets. And um, highlight that we haven't already talked about was a comp going to the comic-con museum opening day it is now open it's open every day now yep. um in balboa park so i gotta go again i think you know i think i have a membership i think i just can go in we'll find out <laughs> more details about that but tickets are still available you get you know uh walk up and buy a ticket you get a one hour block or buy online and um it looked really but, fun like yeah. you were making those like cardboard I just brought mine home. I still have to make it, but, um, oh, I had cardboard. I was going to write them down the cardboard superheroes. So they were the ones putting that on upstairs and I need to find out how often that might go on at the museum, but they had a panel too, um, that they were giving out. I saw people walking around with some amazing Thor hammers that they gave out at their panel. Um, so that's just 
uh, really neat what those guys are doing. And I have brought my Captain America cardboard bits home. So I still have to create it. So I got to get bust out the super glue. Um, and I look forward to seeing what the museum's doing. Um, really great. I did such a quick run through because I wanted to get downtown to the convention. I didn't, I didn't think about that planning, but uh, you know, free play Pac-Man, all the stuff, the Star Trek um, exhibit now, and so much more room to put things. And then also um, costumes from the masquerade that they've borrowed from people uh, was really amazing to see. And you can see all the detailed work close up. So um, they're not behind glass. You can just kind of lean forward and just see all the bead work. It was really neat. So I look forward to going back. Sean, what about you? What were some of your favorite things? Uh, mostly just everything to do with Venom. I mean, if Venom was there, I was feeling good. No. <laughs> I'm literally like wearing uh, right. I, there you Nice. Go. There you go. Amazing. <laughs> Yes. Uh, no, I do love Venom, but it wasn't that wasn't a, a huge part of it this weekend. Um, you know, one of the things that really hit me and I knew I always knew it was going to be kind of an emotional thing that that, you know, rope drop on opening morning of kind of people getting back on the floor. I was very surprised there wasn't a lot more like yelling. I thought there'd be a lot of like, yeah, you know, kind of a thing. But what was really hitting me is those minutes before there was a lot of just like touch within groups like friends significant others arms around each other arms on shoulders hugs kids hugging their parents and I don't know what any of the people were talking about but it all felt like it was like hey we're here this means yeah. something that we're gathered in these shoots about to go onto this floor so that felt really um, special and was something that I loved about it I mean that kind of I think so much of it was the you know seeing people that you missed um, and not been able to see and seeing locations, you know, being inside the sales pavilion, a friend had talked about kind of tearing up because sales pavilions, a important thing for longtime comic con people, you know, and, and the same thing we went up there, and we're inside it. Because, you know, the last couple of Julys have walked up the stairs and looked from the outside, but now to be on the inside with the people um, was special. Um, different vendors, you know, that it's like we would see them all the time in the before times. And then you don't yeah. know, like, are they going to be back? I, there's yeah. um, a vendor we talked to who was quite sick from COVID at a point and they were there and they were healthy. And like that felt really good. Another person um, who does some of their own show running with conventions had talked about in the last few weeks since it had become clear that Comic-Con was happening, all of a sudden, a lot of things were clicking for other shows that they run, that it was like, okay, well, this is, you know, we know Dragon Con and New York Con, we know Megacon, these things are going to happen on the East Coast, but like, wait, this, if Comic-Con's happening in California, maybe we're actually doing this on the West Coast, and yeah. now, whether it's celebrities or comic talent or things like that, so yeah, I think it really so much was the the people and the geographical locations i mean the ride down the escalator was you know the learning the way i learned of the sdcc unofficial blog was the little map that i think jeremy had put together about the route to not go down the sales pavilion and go that other escalator and then it's like well of course this is the way you know people like evic always knew it to do it that way but we didn't know to do it that way in 2009 or whatever it was and like going down that escalator and thinking like how many times have we gone down this escalator for different reasons? This escalator is in part the only reason I know any of you or so many of it. There's like so much significance tied to such a silly thing as an escalator. So uh, to me, it was it was all of those things and, and a lot more that were really favorites. That's awesome. James, what about you? Um, well, I was, I was trying to think about it and People talking in the comments actually reminded me of something that happened. Uh, they were, they've been talking about uh, how many first timers may have shown up and, yep. you know, did they talk to any? And I didn't actually, I don't think I talked to any first timers, but I did overhear people talking and it was just so much fun listening to, I'm, I'm guessing they were friends, but one of them was telling stories of Comic-Con to their friend who obviously had never been before and it's just so much fun hearing people talk about oh yeah and over there that's where that line is and it's always crowded and blah and it was just you know it's so it was just so nice hearing you know it's like the sharing of knowledge and the seeing that someone was being able to experience it uh for the first time and i think that's probably the 
the one thing that I appreciate the most out of this specific convention is that it it opened up Comic Con to new people yeah. and gave gave us a lot of different ways that we can now look at things and experience new things. Even if we had been going like me for twenty something years, yeah, I got to go to the masquerade for the first time. It's just the fact that new things and new people and all of that was happening and being back at a convention. Yes, absolutely. So, I mean, I would say, let me preface this with, I think far and wide, like we have 99% positive things to say about Comic-Con Special Edition. I think all everybody, like I have not seen a single person who was like, I had a miserable time. Like everybody just seemed so happy, just seemed to have so much fun. However, there are, as always, a couple of things that we wish were done a little bit differently, uh, including, uh, Kim, do you want to kick us off here? (laughs) Our lovely programming guide, the Eventony, Eventony, if I'm saying it right. Yeah, I think it's Eventony. How it's embedded in the Comic-Con website um, made it completely unusable. (laughs) And I was so angry that I actually went, well, not angry hardly angry, but um, yeah, <laughs> I figured I, sh- I went to the talk back panel um, and was able to work up enough courage to get up to the microphone and ask the question of if they might be returning to um, SCED or my SCED. What and they said, idea? and they said um, it was no longer available to them, which uh, the room did boo a bit. So now that's in my <laughs> way. So. Maybe they'll think about that a bit more because it's, it is unusable the way it currently is. It's awful. Like, I mean, we keep talking, you can't like filter by room. Like it's so hard to even like share a link. Like it's just, it's when events were canceled. There was no way of knowing. Yeah. When events were canceled, like literally the only way to know was like to go look at the newsletter, like on the morning and the newsletter was hard to find on the website. <laughs> I didn't even uh, know it was there until today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I was like tweeting out the panel and cancellations, uh, but it's because literally I was like checking the newsletter every day, but it, it's just, it's real bad. So we're not thrilled about that. Um, we've got a couple ideas to try to make like figuring out the flow of the rooms look more user-friendly on our end but of course that requires work on our end and quite frankly like comic-con should Mm. just have a better solution so we hope that they come up with one uh and along that same vein i did want to mention we had a lot of questions about the app and the app was not live for this weekend um i mean i think it's a culmination of a lot of things this was like i don't think comic-con had the time or the money or a sponsor to put the app together and i'm sure that figuring out how to like make the app jive with event any instead of sked also would have just taken more time than they probably had so hopefully we will see the return of the app with wondercon but i know we had a lot of questions about that um, and then someone wanted to talk about the merch. Who was that? Oh, I put that in there. Just um, the, I went to go see about the special edition pin early Saturday morning and they had already run out. Um, and I know there was, you know, it's funny because Funko gets cubes of deciding maybe the merch booth for Comic-Con should as well. Um, and there was some issues on the, I saw on Twitter, the two lines, the two lines made sense because people had to be like trying on shirts in the first area. And then you could go to the second line. Um, you could go immediately if you just wanted pins or patches. So that made sense. Um, but the line was often too long. Uh, I think that's on Friday for me to go check it out, but maybe they must've run out of some stuff. So it was easier to get to on Saturday. I think they sold out of a bunch of stuff and they were also, they were selling some shirts for like $5. So if you got one of those, congratulations. Um, does anybody else want to talk about anything else that they wish was done a little bit different at the convention? Only the, the, the COVID lines, hopefully they just need to add way more people to that. I mean, we already talked about that, but there were so many people in line for register in, excuse me, there are so many volunteers inside for registration that there weren't, they need to be half and half so that all the people could be filtered in inside. There was no reason for there to be so many, although it was wonderful to see and amazing, excited volunteers were so great. Yeah, 
So Alex mentioned, yeah, definitely need to take the lack of staff into account for a lot of the negatives about the call. And that's absolutely true. Um, I mean, we heard several times. I mean, I think they just didn't have the amount of staff and volunteers that they would, you know, at San Diego Comic-Con. Um, so I'm sure that this convention posed like a lot of really interesting and different logistic, logistical things for them. Um, but yeah. Uh, and then I think, unfortunately, I think everyone, oh, Andy, you've got your hand raised. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's just the usual stuff. It's the lack of communication, um, lack of signage. Um, committed Comics is in the chat here, and they pointed out that not having an exhibitor-only line for the COVID check was annoying and found out later that, oh, yeah, that one by Hall D was supposed to be uh, exhibitor-only, but nobody knew that until Saturday. So that kind of confusion and then moving things and not really informing the volunteers as well as they probably could have uh, that, that caused some confusion, but uh, on the whole, like, again, I think they could uh, communicate a lot better. Yeah. So I think everyone here would probably agree if I posed the question, like if Comic-Con International held this convention again, would you be interested in going? I think all of you would nod your head. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't think that's in the cards. Um, I did see an interview with David Lanzer over the weekend and he, someone asked him that question and he was basically like, we just don't see it happening. Like it's too close to Comic-Con. Like they did it this year because they hadn't had a convention in so long, but it really and truly sounds like this was a one-off convention, um, which is sad because I mean, I think Honestly, I'm like, this may be the most like positive reactions <laughs> coming out of like any Comic-Con convention I've seen in a very long time. Um, yeah, so that's a little bit of bummer news. Kim, do you want to talk about though some of the positive feedback coming yeah, out? Yeah, I was going to say, now? exactly. There was um, mo oh, quite a few people. I didn't stay for the whole panel, but there, in my time in the room, there were quite a few people just getting up to the microphones, telling people, telling Comic-Con, thank you. Uh, several people mentioned that they would like a November convention again. Um, obviously, I don't think any of us wanted around the holiday, but you know, as they explained, that's just the weekend that they could get. Yep. Um, yep. And it, it worked. We're happy it was here. Yep, absolutely. So I have the most important question of the panel now. Uh, who ate a pretzel? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Everyone but James. Everyone but uh, me. Uh, and how was your pretzel? I know. Let, let's let's leave Sean for last. <laughs> uh, I did try to go twice, and they it was an empty bin of pretzels at the vendors I went to, and then you guys kept talking about it. And finally, Sunday, I found full pretzels, and it was you know, delicious. pretzel. <laughs> Very good. It was a pretzel. <laughs> My pretzel was the perfect perfect temperature it was a deliciously warm soft bready salty greasy heart-stopping snack food that i just doused in cheese and it was so wonderful and i i still don't get the hype but oh i was hungry so <laughs> and then on the other side of that sean how was your pretzel <laughs> Yeah, ours was a dry, tasteless rock, <laughs> and so we didn't ever understand uh, what the thing was about it because we would see the lines, and obviously it wasn't that for most people, so we had a unique, uh, we got the variant exclusive or whatever of it, but yeah, it was not good at all, and so that was... Uh, that was our that was our entire experience with the pretzels at uh, San Diego. But we had lots of other great food in the gas lamp and uh, and even the convention center and stuff. So uh, that was just the the low light of it for us. Well, you know, oh, hold on a second. Um, while we're talking about food and stuff, uh, let's bring up the Wild Bill soda bar that was there and how they actually got away with uh, selling food and food and drink inside the convention center without actually selling food and drink inside the convention center. Did they? Uh, yeah, they, they, they weren't selling the soda. They were selling the cups. 
Um, so you, you bought the, you bought a cup and then they filled it with soda for you. Uh, from what I heard, the uh, the root beer was really good. I didn't get a chance to try it. And if I would have gone there, I would have gone to try it. Yeah, yeah and, I know. Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. It's Robert, because they they go to a lot of the conventions that we go to, in particular Phoenix and stuff, but they weren't allowed to sell any of their unique blends. Robert found this out because he was disappointed that they um, they couldn't sell any of their own stuff because of the convention center's contract with Pepsi. Um, so they didn't have, cause they normally have like this weekend, they'll have a bunch of different, I don't know, pomegranate, blueberry soda or whatever, uh, all sorts of different kind of, uh, flavors and things like that. Um, and usually it's like, if you bring your cup to the other convention, you can still get refills and things like that. But, uh, it was interesting to see them there. That was a surprise. Well, I'm not as, I'm not as sad. I missed it if they couldn't serve their own. I don't. I feel like the root beer was was maybe their own that they kind of snuck in. I don't know. Well, before we start wrapping up, does anybody else want to say anything else about this convention? Any final thoughts? Just you know, well done. I I know that they were short staffed and everything, and and running on on short notice for for all of it, and working with a lot of restrictions and having to do a lot of things differently. And I I felt like they they mostly succeeded uh, yeah. across the board in getting it done and having things that were surprises, uh, you know, throughout. And I don't know, it was just, it was just nice. Yeah. Just low stress is what it looked like. Again, the Comic-Con dream. <laughs> yeah. The um, I know Carmel and I, we've tried to really focus on like giving all of these different places till January to really like complain about anything because it's just everybody's trying. And yeah, I know we're dangerously close with Disneyland, but we'll save that for Disney talk with James's podcast. Um, <laughs> but with this, it was like I expected there to be several things that was like not. I expected to be several things that maybe I'd be a little disappointed, but I was really surprised that there wasn't. I was just really surprised with how well they put everything together, how well they executed um, things, given all of the limitations and the state of the world and having gone so long uh, since having done a show. So I thought it was, it was pretty impressive all the way around. And I did want to say just a quick thing on like the mask thing, because what we've noticed is, convention centers are varying greatly on the mask thing. Um, And so what we're finding basically is whether attendees wear their masks or not consistently really depends on if the convention center staff is wearing their masks. So we've been to several shows where there's signage everywhere about wearing masks. It's in the program, there's announcements, but then pretty much everybody that works at the convention center isn't wearing a mask. And by the time you get to Sunday, nobody's wearing their masks. Um, And that was not the case. This place was like really locked down on the masks. Um, You know, Brent Spiner brought up the fact that he thought it was, you know, kind of absurd that he had to wear it on the panel type thing, but he's like, the rules are the rules and I'm going to do it. And so, you know, so he did it so it was really something i thought with that size of a convention how consistent things were there and how well people respected it in general absolutely absolutely so i did want to mention uh as we tweeted the dates for WonderCon and san diego comic-con they had been announced before but they were reconfirmed so they are officially official again and those are april 1st through 3rd for WonderCon anaheim and July 20th through the 24th, if you include preview night, for San Diego Comic-Con. So mark those on your calendar. Uh, start planning your days off work that you need to request. Uh, and then I also wanted to mention that if you either didn't get a chance to stop by or if you didn't go to the convention, yesterday still has quite a few of their pens up. I know that they are out of uh, the Sunset Heart Pen and the Believe Ted Lasso pen, but I think they've got just about everything else. Uh, but that's up on their site. And then Patrick Balsteros put up the leftovers on his site, and I'm sure others have as well. So if there's something you wanted, like go look at their site, they might have it. All right. Well, uh, thank you, uh, all of you, for joining us for this. Not only your listeners, but uh, Kim and Sean and Andy, thank you for yes. coming on to give us your your thoughts on the show. Um, We'll be uh, back next year, leading up to WonderCon and Comic-Con 2022 with all of the views and special guests uh, you've come to expect from us, hopefully. 
Um, we're looking forward to a regular full season next year. Uh, so uh, we will see you all then. Yeah. You can also sign up for a newsletter, uh, which we will, you know, eventually start sending again, like when we start having news to put in a newsletter. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, Andy, where can we find more of your work on the Internet? Uh, you can find me on Twitter and the IG as SDCC Wacky Wags. Or if you are into uh, the cannabis culture, cannabis industry, uh, I am on there, uh, both platforms again as SD Canna Blogger. And f- this week for my podcast, Canna Bloggers Corner, I actually uh, got to chat with the people who were there for the offsite for the Freak Brothers. So if you guys wanted to check that out, that was something uh, kind of interesting. It was a, a really, it was something that I, I was really happy to see at San Diego, San Diego Comic Con. I think it was a, a mainstream step for uh, something like that. And I hope we see him again. So I appreciate that. And with all that being said, Kim, where can we find more of your work on the internet? Thank you. I'm outside Comic Con on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And Sean, where can we find more of your work on the internet? Uh, Carmel, my wife and I have Parks and Cons and Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube and our podcast. And we've got a Comic-Con wrap-up podcast there and part two coming either tomorrow or Thursday. Can you, can you not like add one more to that list, Sean? Like, is that not, is that not enough? Well, don't forget there's the website yeah. that has all of those links on it. That's Parks true. And there is yeah. the website. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. You never know which one's going to not exist anymore in five years so we try (laughs) that's very true all right well you can find me on the internet uh at carrie dixon on twitter and if you find me anywhere else go away uh james where can we find you on the internet i am uh all over the internet at dan regal and you can also check out geekshotphoto.com for all of our social media links for uh, my wife and i beth and thank you to beth our producer for editing the show and uh, getting all the things done that get it into your ears after the fact. Absolutely. Thank you, Beth. Yeah. We are on iTunes. If you'd like to subscribe, the links are up on the blog or you can search for SD Concast. If you like what you've heard so far, please review us. We are also on Stitcher Radio and the link is in the show notes. We also have a Patreon, uh, which helps keep the lights on on our website. And every penny that we make goes back into the blog. You can find the link to that on our website. And uh, I can tweet that out, which I don't think I've done in a while. So. And if you want to get a hold of us, you can send us an email at sdcomicon.blog at gmail.com. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash sdconblog or tweet us at sd underscore comic underscore con. Uh, Thank you all for listening and watching and everybody. Go, Go. Oh, Shmarma. Shmarma.